Hello, everyone, and welcome to 180 Degrees of Impact. My name is Matt Scott, and today I have the honor of being joined by Dr. Hina Brampat. Hina, how are you doing today? Good, good. Very nice to connect with you, Matt. Yeah, it's good to connect and good to, to have you. Um, I was going to say good to have you here, but we're uh, seven hours apart in terms of time zones. You're in, in South Africa. Uh, so actually one question that, that I'd love to start out with, how are things in <laughs> where you are in South Africa? What's it, it like? Because I haven't been and I'd love to, to visit. Well, um, politically, it's, it, it's as interesting as it is for you in the U.S. these days <laughs> with our leadership um, and all kinds of craziness going on. Um, South Africa is lovely. I mean, I moved here about um, 13 years ago uh, and uh, we, we live in, I live in Johannesburg. I love the weather. Um, it's a country where you can enjoy the city, you can enjoy the mountains, there's skiing, there's uh, the ocean, there's the safaris, and kind of provides a little bit of everything for everyone. Um, it's, it's far more developed than the average African country, so it feels like a bit of a European country with African climate and culture. So you do, you do have sort of access to infrastructure and things that one may enjoy in the West um, in South Africa. So yeah, you must make a plan to come visit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you you also touched on something. There's a lot there that that's really interesting, other than all of the different uh, the the beauty of South Africa. And you, you mentioned the, the political aspects, which, of course, we could relate to um, in D.C. and in the U.S. But, um, you know, something I'd love to get into as we go along is just um, the insights that you have from your experience because you've done a lot uh, when it comes to not just South Africa, but throughout Africa, you've done a lot when it comes to HIV, child mortality, and, and other topics. And, you know, those are, I think for a lot of people, but definitely myself included, those are topics or areas where, you know, I think sometimes we think we know a lot more than we know. And so I would love, yeah. to, I'm looking forward to learning from you more as we go along here, which is, Kind of what this is all about but uh, just as we get started i would love if you could uh, introduce yourself or share how like how do you introduce yourself and sum yourself up you know i don't know that's a really interesting question so the first question that sort of stumps me is when people ask where are you from yeah. um you know and I, and I know what that question really is trying to get it because they look at you and they're like you kind of look indian but who knows you could be egyptian or i, I don't know i've had other things thrown at me and um it, it's a, it's it's an interesting question for me because i i am of indian origin but i've never lived in india um i was born in tanzania uh, grew up in nairobi in kenya and uh, then when my parents moved to haberoni in botswana in the late 80s, I went to boarding school in the UK to finish high school, um, after which I moved to the US when I was about 19 and stayed there till I finished my graduate studies and then, you know, obviously joined faculty at Hopkins. Um, so when introducing myself is, is always interesting. I mean, I, I guess I'm somewhat of a global nomad. I feel comfortable in many different settings. Um, home has been where I create community um, and I develop friendships and relationships. and I've been fortunate to have that in many settings I've lived in um, that I feel, you know, an affinity towards uh, because of the relationships that we've developed. Um, so it's interesting. My husband is a fourth generation South African and um, for him very much, you can see the differences that he feels a lot more um, like his roots are from South Africa and, and this is home and this is where even his grandfather was born. Um, so, I, I don't I don't sort of have the same experience, I think, growing up because I moved around so much where um, I, I necessarily feel a, a specific affinity or loyalty to a, a country or a, or a people. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I really do feel very comfortable in many different places um, that I've lived in. And I'm happy for the adventure to continue if it takes me. Yeah. And then what is that? It's interesting to, to think about because um, you know, there's, you also touched on just the complexity that comes with identity, which I always, which I think is really interesting. And, you know, if you're talking about identity in the U.S. context, that's one thing. If you're talking about an identity in the South African context, that's one thing. 
And then you think of like all of these different places you lived. You mentioned Tanzania, you mentioned uh, living in Nairobi and Kenya and then the U.S. And so uh, I, I think it's always fascinating to see just what s someone's perception is of all of these different um, places they, they live in and move through because that does affect uh, the work that you're doing, I'm guessing. Uh, but, you know, I, w I would love to kind of hear more about like what is the like LinkedIn, what I'll call the LinkedIn explanation of like what you you do. So um, I think so that this I have different facets. I think of my identity. There's the me that um, is is a passionate reader that uh, loves physics, um, that loves to understand human behavior and psychology. And a ve that has very little to do with my work, um, which is HIV prevention. Okay. My LinkedIn profile is interesting because, you know, you it, it, it has a format that makes you summarize your work uh, experiences and in essence, put a list of your resume. Yeah. Um, and, and although my work has always been um, more of a calling than a career, um, I, I it, it's only been an aspect of what I really love to do. And right. um, so the LinkedIn me, you know, uh, sort of started off her career very interested in looking at um, how to improve health of, of uh, poor communities. Um, and uh, I was specifically interested in child survival. And I happened to, at Hopkins, when I did my PhD, my advisor was um, had a big HIV prevention study in Uganda. And I was given the opportunity to nest my PhD work looking at mothers and infants um, in that study. And that continued to sort of start the course of my career and then did many other things. I've worked um, you know, at the needle exchange program in Baltimore as a student. Um, it's really, really good to be a poor student uh, because you're desperate for work and it forces you um, to, to take up opportunities you wouldn't if you weren't desperate for money. Um, so I came from a family where, um, you know, I, I got a full scholarship for my PhD, but had to sort of support myself. And same thing in college where I got partly scholarship. My parents could pay for part of my tuition, but I had to find money to live on. And being at that time, I wasn't an American citizen. So being an international student, I was only allowed to work 20 hours a week in school. Um, so in college, for example, I was a research assistant with my biology teacher. And I spent weekends uh, in the mountains in Pennsylvania correcting, uh, collecting um, bat poop because she was really interested in studying the feeding patterns of bats. And um, I would never have had that experience if I didn't need the money and was willing to do just about anything. Um, and then at Hopkins, I joined, um, I got a job at the Needle Exchange uh, office, um, which is part of Hopkins, and really got exposed to the whole field of harm reduction and key populations and injecting drug users. And um, I was part of a team that did a big study in India looking at buprenorphine substitution for, um, uh, uh, for injecting drug users. Um, and these were all experiences that had nothing to do with my actual dissertation work. I just was very curious by nature, loved learning new things, and so was happy to take on challenges um, and opportunities as they came along, and happy to learn and, and educate myself if it was a field I wasn't familiar with. Um, and in fact, every time I feel like, okay, I actually have figured this out, I am happy to try and, and get into a completely new field. And so for my dissertation, for example, we found uh, that if a, if a pregnant mother uh, was HIV positive and she was infected with malaria, her risk of transmission, transmitting HIV to the child was a lot higher than if she had HIV alone. Wow. Um, so we published it and it was, you know, uh, summarized in science. I was interviewed by BBC News and CNN. And it was a big thing because it had a big policy implication. Um, but for me, that wasn't enough. I wanted to really understand what was happening biologically. And so... I walked into the malaria labs at Hopkins and said, I really want to understand what's happening here. Mm -hmm. uh, for starters, I'd like to, uh, if anyone can recommend a textbook on malaria so I can understand the parasite. And I spent a month just reading and understanding the biology. And then I asked if I can follow somebody in the lab to see how malaria is actually diagnosed and spent a few weeks just tagging along and saying, OK, now I understand what's happening. And it was really interesting because I brought in my perspective as an HIV epidemiologist and the malaria person did and we put our heads together. We realized there was something really interesting happening. So when you give the current uh, sort of recommendation by the World Health Organization is to give a pregnant woman two doses of malaria prophylaxis if she's living in an area which is endemic for malaria. 
Mm -hmm. um, what we found is that your half-life, so how effective the medicine is, is about one month if you're HIV positive, and it's about six months if you're not. So clearly, if you're HIV positive and I give you two doses for malaria prophylaxis, it's not going to pr protect you against malaria. Um, so it, it's, it's just one example of um, uh, you know, my journey in, in trying to really be a student in every way that I can. And, and when you're confronted with something, try and look deeper, try and understand what is really going on. And people are very willing to talk to you and help you if you're a curious student, whatever age you are. Wow, this is so, it's so interesting. And there were, there's so many thoughts that come up for me, but one that is, well, the first one that comes up is um, even just thinking about uh, just the passion with which you're talking about your journey and talking and kind of blowing my mind a little bit, because again, even just in this conversation, I'm getting educated about the work that you're doing, which is one of the, the great things about this. But uh, also, I, I think, you know, something that's occurring to me too is that a lot of the realizations you have, uh, this might sound obvious to people, but of course they're, you know, they're saving lives and they're really helping people and making people healthier in tangible ways. Like it's not just a, a general field of work and you're, you're working to make the world a better place or to help certain populations, but you're actually even just in that example that you gave, I, I think I'm a little bit amazed thinking about the power of health and science and of, of using that insight and to, to save lives and make people's lives better. Um, is that something that has occurred to you? Because I feel like there are people, you know, all, you probably meet people all the time who are impressed by your work but this is your, your day to day. So I kind of wonder. Yeah, I, I you know, I, I guess I've never thought of, you know, from a young age, um, I grew up in a household where education was very, very important, mm -hmm. but it was only important insofar as it can be used to help others. So I still remember going into my adolescence at the same time my mother was transitioning into menopause and we were both like at each other. <laughs> and my mother didn't have the same opportunities to, to get educated that I did. Yeah. Um, and uh, my father uh, 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 printed some articles on menopause, asked me to read them, and then we went on a long car ride to talk about it. And he said, the reason I've asked you to read this is because you've had opportunities your mother hasn't, and if you feel that the purpose of your education is so we can sort of accumulate an accolades of good academic accomplishments, then I feel I've failed as a parent because that is not the purpose of your education. And it's great that you're working hard and doing well, but really the purpose of education is to use that knowledge to help somebody, to use that knowledge to feel humble and to feel compassionate towards somebody else and to see how you can utilize that information to help somebody. And that's been sort of who I've been my whole life is, you know, you could be a gardener and you'll know so much more about gardening and landscaping than I ever will. And you'll be an interesting person to me because you're passionate about what you're doing, and it's something I have no idea about. Um, and by nature, I, I get drawn to people who are just curious, who want to learn, and who, you know, who uh, have devoted themselves to, to a subject, and you can learn from them. And that's that to me. I've always approached my my work in that way. Is I've had access to opportunities because of the uh, families who I was born into, where our education was uh, a focus. I easily could have been born into a family where it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't think there's anything unique about me um, apart from the fact that I came from an environment which is very supportive yeah. um, of education. And I, I did my part in that way and I worked hard and I, I, I sort of did well, but that's all I've done. Um, and what's more exceptional is, is kids who've never had any of that and still excel because I'm not sure I would have been one of those children, you know? Yeah. Um, I've always, I was always interested in health and science because I enjoyed the aspect of understanding things from a biological and scientific pers uh, perspective and, and it's just something I was excited about. And so that, that, that uh, interest could have taken me to many different uh, areas and fields. Um, and I was such a planner as a child and yet most of the important decisions in my life and the journey in my career has happened completely randomly. So I thought um, I was gonna be a medical doctor uh, it became very clear that um, when I did, wasn't an American citizen at that time, I didn't even have a green card, that 
Mm. Um, the money my parents have to put forward for me to start medical school in the US was not possible. They didn't have $150,000 to put in an escrow account, which was required by some of the medical schools. Wow. So I remember I was 25 years old. It was um, May, 9th, uh, May 1995. And um, I had realized I can't start medical school in the US and had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And I knew I wanted to do something with public health, but what the hell is public health? I have no idea. Um, and so I walked into the admissions office at Hopkins and I said, I would like to apply. And she looked at me and she goes, you do know that the deadline was in February and we're in May and the course is starting in a month. Yeah. And I said, I do. And I said, I will sit here and I'll convince you why you need to give me a chance. And I, I said, listen, I've come from a long journey. I was this girl in a no-name school in Kenya, and I'm standing in front of you. And I promise you, if you give me a chance and I get accepted, I will never get a B in my entire academic course. I will work harder than any student you have. Just give me a chance. And I remember she looks at me. It was this woman called an African-American woman. I still remember how she looks, Leonera Davis. And she just started laughing, and she's like, I have worked for over 20 years and no one has had the audacity to walk into my office. But tell you what, she goes, I am so taken by your passion for this. I am going to um, get in touch with the admissions committee. If they're willing to look at your application, then uh, it's up to them. And that's all I can do. And she calls me a week later and said, you were accepted. They looked at it and, you know, uh, uh, they were, I told them about how, what you did and they were all moved by that. And it started my journey and I did my master's in public health, still had no idea what exactly I wanted to do. Um, and I, I had a friend at the time who was a gynecologist doing her MPH. And she says to me, um, I said, you know, and I was trying to take the maximum credits per term so I could graduate early and save my parents one term of tuition fees. Right. Uh, I think they stopped doing that at Hopkins after me because nobody else had attempted that. Mm -hmm. And um, anyways, uh, um, she said there's this course for population dynamics. I'm like, what the hell is population dynamics? She's like, no, it looks interesting. It's like demography and you think about population health and you look at reproductive health. And I said, okay, I need four credits. Let me just take it. So I ended up taking this course, population dynamic, and the instructor then, uh, Dr. Henry Mosley, was the department chair for population dynamics. And I ended up doing well in the course. And at the end of the course, he said, so what do you plan to do after this the MPH? And I said, I had absolutely no idea. Um, I was going to go into medicine, but that doesn't look like it's happening. And I really don't know. So he's like, why don't you apply to a PhD? And I said, PhD? I didn't think about that. Um, and I said, but my parents can't afford it. He's like, I think you'll be eligible for a scholarship. Why don't you apply? I applied and I got in and I got a full scholarship. Wow. And I found myself doing a PhD in public health with no real idea as to what I wanted to do. Um, and they just started me on the journey. Like I used every summer to look for internships to make money. So I ended up in Haiti on a child survival project my first summer after my uh, MPH. Um, I worked for Population Service International in Botswana, driving around Botswana looking at their social condom, uh, condom social marketing program. And Every summer, I try to, you know, expand my knowledge, uh, make money, and, and, and just learn about how public health works. What are the different ways in which you can impact health? You can transform communities. Um, and it doesn't, it could be health. Um, I'm really passionate about education and how to improve access to good quality education for all children. I don't think good quality education is supposed to be a privilege. Um, and... Um, and in fact, I'm, I'm also trying to now develop a platform uh, for uh, adolescents to engage in a positive way. And I'll, I'll talk about that later because that's how I came across Second Youth uh, and, and, and their platform because it was something I've been working on. And I, I, I've spent a lot of time working with children and adolescents, but more in the space of sexual risk behaviors. Um, I understand sort of the biology of adolescence where the part of your brain, your frontal lobe doesn't fully develop till you're 25 or 30. Yeah. And yet every single intervention in HIV and sexual risk reduction is if you do this, that happens. But yet the part of their brain that can process action to consequences is not fully developed. So if you don't understand the biology, every single intervention which uses the way an adult thinks is gonna fail in adolescence, you know? Yeah. So yeah, but that's sort of a, my sketchy summary, I mean, a journey um, uh, uh, through my career. Yeah, but I think it's, it's powerful because uh, as you were talking through that, I think it's abundantly clear that one thing that has benefited you on your journey is just 
the audacity to, to, to show up in the office and to say, I want this, I'm not going to, you know, get below a B in this, in these courses. And that worked out for you. And then, you know, the audacity to actually pursue your PhD or dig into the research and, and, you know, pursue this, uh, this field really when, it, and I'm, I'm thinking of HIV, uh, child mortality and other um, public health related topics that are, you know, sometimes difficult, or at least to me seem difficult to, to approach. Um, and so that's actually another aspect I wanted to ask about, not just for uh, anyone who's listening or watching who's doing public health, but also like for me, for instance, uh, when I was in college, and then even still to this day, I'll still do um, facilitation when it comes to like sexual assault and sexual violence and and so, or and healthy relationships related to that um, and I feel like there's something there's definitely a, a heavy part to that but then also you're helping people by the work that you're doing and so I would just love to hear from you like how how have you has it been difficult for you to uh, take on these heavier topics or has you know, have you really reveled in the ability to make lives better? So I'll tell you, um, it, 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 it's, it's a bit more of a complex um, question uh, to answer, and I'll tell you why. Um, so what I think researchers do sometimes is they distance themselves from a problem by thinking of things in terms of numbers. Yeah. Um, it's very easy to do that when you are at Hopkins and your studies are internationally and everything feels like a statistic. Mm -hmm. um, and and yes, you know, you're kind of aware of what the suffering is of living with HIV, but not really, you know. And when I, I teach this course um, on HIV prevention um, in uh, uh, children, adolescents, and women at Hopkins, I've been teaching it since 2002. And one of the things we did in that course is we had an HIV counselor come and talk to the students. Um, she was infected uh, by her ex-husband um, uh, who, who had, uh, you know, extramarital relationships. She then didn't realize she was positive and got pregnant and infected her child, mm -hmm. um, who must be in her 20s now. And every year, I would have Rosemary, who was an HIV counselor in, um, in Baltimore, come and talk to the students and share stories. And she would also bring adolescents, her daughter at the time, other people that she knew who were HIV positive, and people talked about their experiences. Yeah. And I always ask the students, you know, what was the most uh, enriching part of the course? And yes, I bombard them with all the epidemiology and the statistics. And every one of them would mention, you know, her, her talk and that how, you know, she really personalized the epidemic. And unless you're a clinician working with patients one on one, it's very easy in public health when you're dealing with large population, you know, health interventions to distance yourself and not be closely involved. Um, my perspective then shifted even more sort of living in South Africa because um, I now live uh, around communities and work in a country which has one of the largest HIV epidemics in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but HIV is just one of the problems. And that's the other thing that I realized is that health only determines about 10% of a human's well-being. Are you interested in the other 90%, which is access to good education, clean water, food security, um, lack of violence? There are many, many things you know, that people's lives are, are impacted by. And when you're in um, a resource poor setting, uh, living, um, that there's so many determinants of, that are driven by poverty. And it doesn't actually matter if you're male or female, everybody suffers, you know, equally. And um, when you approach things in a very siloed manner where I am interested in making sure my research study is effective or I'm meeting my target, you really are missing a bigger picture and a context of people's lives. Um, so one of the big things people struggle with is, is making sure adolescents adhere to their treatment. Well, guess what? If you're hungry, you're not going to want to take big pills every single day. Um, if you are socializing with friends, you don't want others to see you taking a pill um, on the weekends. So an adolescent is actually an adolescent, whether they're HIV infected or not. And you need to start understanding the context and reality of their lives to try and see that if, if, if you have poor public health education, as we do in South Africa, and you send your children to 12 years of school, and at the end of the 12 years of school, they can barely read. They're barely doing well enough to, um, uh, to have gotten acceptance into university. They don't have a job. Why should they care about staying alive and healthy and taking the HIV drugs? Why should they care about having unprotected sex when they have nothing to look forward to tomorrow? So 
So it, it's really, really important, I think, to try and understand that people are embedded in real lives and contexts, and that if, if your goal is really to try and help them to not go in with an agenda or a, or, or a view that you know what the problem is and that you're going to solve it, but rather sit back and listen to them, because they'll often tell you what they're struggling with and what they're challenged with, and maybe if you fix that, then the other stuff that, you, that you, you're worried about will take care of it, you know? Yeah, and it, it's it's fascinating to think about because it's a, uh, you know, there's a lot. I, you said something that I think um, is really, well, there's a lot really that's important, but something that, that jumped out at me is just that you are working with real humans and, and real people, and there are real people who have full lives intertwined in this. So you mentioned, for instance, a teen, an adolescent, an adolescent, you know, whether or not they have HIV and you have to consider all the factors in their lives and it's, it's complicated and it's a lot to, to manage and, and handle um, or, you know, to navigate. But something that I want to ask about just as it relates to, you know, the perceptions that, that someone who doesn't do the work might have about the work and the people involved. Like, is there anything that you've learned along the way just about people I know it's a general, broad question, but anything you've learned about people in doing your work in all these different contexts in these different countries and different communities along the way? You know, the one thing I've learned um, is that people are incredibly smart and motivated to improve the circumstances of their lives. Um, if you give them uh, a, 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 a seat at the table as an equal, you will find that um, people in any community you work in has incredible amount to co contribute to. And you have to go in it thinking of them as partners and important you know, agents of changes of their own lives. Most of my colleagues, um, when I worked in Uganda, in Tanzania, now in South Africa, I think are way smarter and hardworking than I ever will be. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, and, and I, I can see the difference. At Hopkins, you, know, you have the, uh, a big wall where every day at lunch, um, if they put a whole list of speakers, you know, and so every expert in any field will be there speaking. So you grab your lunch and you're like, ah, today I want to hear this Nobel laureate talk about, you know, genes, da, 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 and I'll sit there. And in one hour, I will learn something about somebody who's an expert in their field. Well, guess what? Well, the rest of the world doesn't have that kind of easy access to information. Right. Um, well, so you really have to work hard to just update yourself in your own field, let alone having those incredibly multidisciplinary perspective that being in an institution, you know, uh, 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 any of the very good institutions in the U.S. can provide for you. Um, and yet, you know, when you sit down and talk to the people there, they have real life experiences and knowledge that far exceed anything you could bring to the table based on what you've learned. And often I had to throw out of the window the things that I learned as a student because I realized that it just makes no sense in the real world. And you have to learn to adapt. You have to learn to listen to people and say, you know what? Let's think about a creative way. And, and, and maybe you have ways to do things that I haven't even thought about or learned about. And often they do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and similarly with communities, like we, we try to do a project right now where we were trying to get young men engaged in healthcare. It's a really difficult thing to get young men tested for HIV and whatnot. And we thought we would try and engage with young men whose soccer structures. Um, soccer is a big thing, or football, as you call it in the US, um, in this part of the world. And, um, you know, as, often the soccer coach is the only adult role model that's a constant in the lives of many of these young children who have, whose parents live in other places or they've lost them because of HIV and whatnot. And so, you know, um, I, I, I drove with one of the coaches and he drove with Soweto. Soweto is like a large township here in, in, in Johannesburg um, and showed me where the soccer pitches were. And many in, 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 in abysmal and shocking condition. And he's like, the kids love soccer so much. And this is their only outlet. They come here every evening and play. And, and I asked him about, like, you know, why don't kids want to get tested? And he's like, well, because you feel, what is the point? You know, I don't want to know if I'm positive. Like, I don't even know if I have a job. I haven't finished school. Like, and, and, and sitting there talking to him, I felt I learned a lot more than any class could have taught me. Um, I learned about the impact of poverty. I learned, you know, his grandmother was raising him and uh, four siblings. I learned about what orphanhood um, does to young people's lives in a very real way. Mm -hmm. um, he was the only one who was a soccer coach. Four of his siblings didn't have a job. And just that afternoon spent with this young boy taught me a lot more than any, you know, research article could have. And I think that's what the important thing is. You need to bridge the gap. 
you need to start having dialogues and, and conversations, you know, um, with people you ordinarily won't, because you feel if you do that, it'll start expanding the way you think. And you have to let go of holding on to notions of you have, there's just one way of doing things right. Yeah. Um, and then you're open to just getting feedback and, and, and trying different approaches to help people. Yeah, I think about when you're talking about that, about um, the, the story you're giving earlier, just about, you know, you and your mom growing up and like, I, and your dad saying like, here, here's, here's the research about menopause, like understand this issue and, and him kind of taking that perspective of helping um, you understand or teaching you like it's, it's a good practice to try to seek understanding sometimes or a lot of the time so i i kind of wonder for you uh because it sounds like that's been a really formative experience you know kind of picking up on oh okay i understand why uh why he might not want to be tested and so on and so forth has that like has that changed how you've like the types of wisdom you've passed on to others yeah, absolutely because i realized that at the end of the day human nature is quite similar we all want the same things. We're all um, struggling with different things. Uh, we would all react with uh, stressors in a similar way. Um, you know, they may be the exception of people who are able to rise about things, but on average, all of us react things. And if you connect with people on a human level, you start and try and put yourself in that person's shoes, you can see very readily how you would make very similar choices. Um, and then you stop judging. And you stop, uh, you know, trying to sort of impose your own uh, way of seeing life on anybody else. Um, the study we did in India on injecting drug users, I speak Hindi fluently. And so my colleagues at, at Hopkins had me talking to the participants. And I remember talking to this uh, drug users. He was a slum dweller and I got down to the floor. So he was really taken back and I sat next to him. And I said, tell me about your life. How did you start injecting? And he said, you know, I was one of eight kids and my parents were drug users and they basically, you know, had gave it to us. And it was an escape from poverty, from depression, from having no food, from having nothing to do. And he's like, but if there's anything I can do to help somebody else not live the same life I have, I would. Because he says, if I walk into that road right now and I die, there's not a single human being that would miss me. Um, and he's like, that's worse than a dog. And that's what my life has become. And he's like, you know... I, 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 yes, I, I was a child and I, you know, my parents were doing this, but there is nothing I would give to ch change the course of my life and anything I can do to make sure another young person doesn't come down the same path. And, and I, I'll, I'll always remember his face. I'll remember what he said, you know, in, in those 10 minutes of conversations when I sat down with him really impacted me. And it really impacted how I think about helping individuals in the settings. Like it's really is important that you understand where people come from. And me going there and saying, oh, you know, can we just get you on methadone substitution? Blah, blah, blah. Like, it's really not, you know, there's so much stigma around drug users. There are people, doctors who won't even treat you if you're a drug user. I mean, drug use was, wasn't even an issue. These guys were injecting antihistamines and cold syrup and things that they could get from a pharmacy. And so they had abscesses all over their body because they kept uh, blocking their veins. Yeah. So our immediate issue, actually, we had to forget about our intervention for a start. And just try and do basic infection control because this, they were basically rotting it. Um, and so, yeah, I know it, it, it's sort of um, uh, the whole background and childhood of thinking about what the purpose of knowledge and education is, um, and and not allowing that to, to 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 make you feel arrogant or or superior to anybody else, uh, because it almost feels like it. That's an oxymoron, like education and knowledge should impart you with wisdom and humility and not arrogance and superiority. And yet a lot of people use it for that. Um, and I've, I've, I've sort of been lucky where I grew up, uh, you know, with, um, with a very strong and principled family where we really were raised to think about uh, our contribution and service and giving back. And education was just a tool to do that. Um, but you don't have to be educated to make a difference in the lives of people. Yeah. Um, you just have to care. You, you know, we, there was a story I saw recently about this farmer who basically planted, I don't know, like 30 trees a day or something. And now he, he has like the thousands of acres of forest that he built since he was like 13 or something in a desert. Like to me, this guy is like a hero and an incredible human being. He's probably never been to school. 
and yet has probably done more for the environment and he's found than that I ever could with all my education. And so this sharing of stories and, you know, we're so lucky now in the age of social media where we can get access to this information. Like yeah. part of the reason I was audacious when I was, um, you know, in my twenties is because we didn't have WhatsApp and Google and all these things. I had no idea what anybody else did, you know? So I, I, I was not clouded by fear and comparison. Um, I was able to chart my own journey and I didn't allow sort of all the things that could go wrong happen and I had nothing to compare myself with. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, you know, that's probably the positive of us growing up not with, you know, with all the things that the generation now is, is you don't constantly compare yourself to others. Yeah, yeah, that's so, that's so deep. And I'm even just thinking about the, um, yeah, because that's that's really been my life growing up, you know, being exposed to other people's lives. And then there are the benefits of that, which is, uh, you know, just having more opportunities to to understand or better understand people's experiences. But then at the same time, you know, there is that that comparison or that constant comparison. Um, then going back even just to the, the basis of of. Um, I think the basis of my last question about uh, just understanding, is there anything that you've seen as like the barriers that people have to, um, to seeking that understanding? Or is that just something that kind of, you know, it's still a head scratcher? Like, I, I don't understand. I think it's, 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 yeah. Yeah, I think it's partly upbringing people, you know, and including myself, yeah. we all come with uh, filters and barriers and prejudices. Um, against people um, and experiences. Um, you know, if you were raised to think of your education as something to sort of be successful and financially successful and have a leadership position, you start thinking about the purpose of education in those terms. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that becomes part of your identity as opposed to a tool to do what you were meant to do. Yeah. Um, you know, we as a woman and a woman of color, um, I've seen people, I'll, I'll be sitting in a room full of men. And uh, even though I'm the principal investigator of the study, most of the men won't make eye contact with me. They will talk to people in my team. Um, and it, 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 it's, it's, it's an ongoing struggle, you know, and moving to South Africa and realizing that they had experienced apartheid in this lifetime, in my lifetime. My husband did, you know, like I grew up, you know, on one hand being told that the sky is the limit. You can achieve anything you want to if you work hard. He didn't. He was told, listen, you're a person of color and um, don't dream too big uh, because there's only finite number of careers that are accessible to you. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting, right? Like our, our environment, our upbringing, um, you know, studies have shown that even the poorest children, um, if they have one parent who who is uh, understands the importance of education, that child ends up doing a lot better than the children who don't. So it's, 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 it's a very powerful tool and it's a powerful equalizer if we provide access to quality education to everyone, um, which we don't. And so now it's become a thing of privilege and status that you know you go to the private schools. My children go to private school in South Africa. We don't have very good um, public schools um, in South Africa. If they did, I would love for them to go um, to public school like they would have if we lived in the US um, and, and be with children with, with, in a variety of backgrounds as opposed to the current bubble that they're all growing up in. So you have to work very hard, um, even with your children, to try and crown them. And it's very difficult when you can afford to give them absolutely anything and you choose not to. Because you realize that that's, that's not the purpose of all these material things. You know, we work hard for these things, but really, if I just keep dumping material things to you, you will never understand the value of, um, of, of working hard and making a difference. And you get to attach to things that bring no happiness, ultimately, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I've seen and all kinds of people in my life, the people who have been profoundly wise and, and helpful and and humble despite like the most incredible ach achievements. And I've chosen to make them my role models and mentors. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, uh, that's what I think is really important for young people is to, be, to, to make sure everyone needs mentors and you need support systems and you need advocates. And just be careful about who you choose because you start emulating uh, your role models and you start emulating the company you keep. Mm -hmm. And it's not a very easy thing to do um, when you develop personal relationships, but yet ethically, they're profoundly different from you and, and their focus in life and what the difference they want to make in life is very different from the one you want to. Mm -hmm. um, 
be careful, I think, about uh, the people you choose to have close relationships with, with the mentors you choose um, to guide you, because they will continue to try and bring you back on the path even when you go off, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that's, that's really great advice and something I hear a lot, but something else I'm, I'm curious to hear is who have some of those mentors been for you or who are some of those mentors for you on your journey that are contributing that positive influence on your life? So it's been interesting. Like I am um, from a young age, really, really believe in um, female solidarity and mm -hmm. friendship. Um, Unfortunately, I've never ended up working with, uh, with a female who's landed up being a positive mentor to me. And I've never understood why. I, I, I definitely strive to do so um, myself now with young women that I mentor. Mm -hmm. But in my case, uh, either through circumstance uh, or I don't know, it landed up being the men. Um, so my department chair um, at Hopkins, I mean, no, my uh, thesis advisor was a, a real powerful mentor and support system to me throughout my PhD years really um, guided me through the whole process of being having an academic career, being a successful grant writer. Um, and then I was lucky after that to have a department chair, uh, Bob Blum, who was very supportive. And I, 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 I sort of graduated in 2002 and I was married in 2005 and I got pregnant on my honeymoon and realized I needed to move to South Africa because my parents live in Botswana and I needed help with childcare. So I was going to quit. And Bob sat me down and he said to me, you know, I am a lot more, I, I'm 20 years your senior and I have some advice you can take about. It. And he said, I've seen women of your age do three things. He says, there's a woman who um, basically acts like there is no children. So you continue working like crazy and crazy hours. And he's like, that's just dumb. Never do that. Because if you're ever given the choice between your family and work, always choose and prioritize your family. He says, then I've seen the woman who quits everything. And is like, I'm a mother, I can't, you know, this is what I, I want to be devoted to my children. And guess what? The children go to school for full days. And then you're, you're like, oh, wait, what the hell am I doing at home alone all day long? And I want to go back into work. And they really struggle because it's really difficult to sort of get back in when you've been out of the working uh, field for a long time. And he said, the model I have found has been very successful is one where you lower your expectations. At the time, I was sort of one of the stars of the department, in his words, um, and was doing very well, successful in leveraging funding and resources, had received a lot of awards, and just sort of, sort of was rising in my career. And he's like, you need to lower your expectations now. You cannot do 100% of everything. So don't try and publish 10 papers a year. Publish three. Like, lower your expectations and, 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 and set goals and standards that are realistic and where you're able to still be a mother. And it was the best advice I had because I think that's what kept me in the game. Uh, mm -hmm. when, and I had three children, one after the other, they, you know, each uh, two, two years apart. And uh, my career sort of went like from that <laughs> and then like a stagnant. And it was, it was really um, a difficult part of my journey because I, as much as I, I, I can sit here now and tell you that, you know, my career, my, my job is not part of my identity. I didn't realize how much it was until it was taken away from me. Yeah. And I moved to South Africa where no one knew me, no one knew or cared what Hopkins was. Um, even though I was a full-time faculty, I was sort of like floating as a free agent here. And everything I felt that my identity was embedded in was taken away from me. And I had to sort of reinvent myself as a mother, as an independent researcher here who's working sort of long distance from Hopkins. And it was, it was a difficult uh, but necessary journey for me because it was through the journey that I was able to let go of the things that shackled me to, to um, status, um, to promotions and all the other things that ultimately don't matter to me um, and free me to do the things that I wanted to do. Yeah. And so it, it took that kind of struggle, uh, a painful journey and struggle to find myself and find my purpose and to remember what it is that I did this for in the first place and let the rest of it go because it's all fluff. Yeah, do you see a lot of or, or do you encounter um, uh, young people who are in that place where you were before you received that positive mentorship? Uh, because I think oh, some, some, <laughs> something I wonder is just what that, uh, what that transition point is, because I'm sure there are lots of people who, you know, are, you know, in their like later 20s like I am or whatever it might be. And they're thinking, uh, that's amazing, but 
you know, I don't know how I'm going to get from where I am now to where you, you know, where you are. Yeah. And so I kind of wonder what, what sort of advice you would pass on. So I, I really felt fortunate. I mean, I, I, don't, I, I think I was lucky to have led it up with incredible matters. I mean, obviously you do your part and you work hard and you bring something to the table. So um, the people who are mentoring you need to be able to respect you and, and, and see that you're trying and that you're working hard to get what you want to. But I, I had uh, friends um, who were doing their PhD at the same time and the same advisor they had the most horrific relationship with. Mm-hmm. And I, I thought they were just uh, as hardworking and accomplishing just as much as I was. And it really is, is, is a tricky thing, I think, to navigate. Um, it's, it's also to realize that you can't put the control of your happiness and, and um, who you are in other people's hands, you know. So... You may have the bad luck. Listen, not everyone can choose to have that ideal dream advisor if you're doing a PhD, but there's many professions and many fields where you, you would have mentors. Um, if you can choose your mentor, then do it carefully um, and make sure that person's personality and, and value system is aligned to you. If you have no choice in the matter, then don't take things this person is doing personally. And you can always find other people who can mentor you, you know, if you're stuck with a person because of circumstances. Not to take and uh, not to take it internally. Um, I think that was my problem. As uh, I, I think women in general tend to do that. We tend to internalize things a lot mm. um, and uh, take things too personally. And I feel like that males sort of have this ability to sort of let things go. Like if somebody said something negative to me, I would be, you know, stewing over it for days and nights. And I'm, 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 I'm you know, no longer affects me as much. But definitely at that age, it did. Um, and part of it is, I think it's really important, and there's so much out there for, for young people um, to be more mindful. Um, you know, all the research on mindfulness and meditation is not just talk. I mean, it really, there's a science to show mm-hmm. that you can take as many leadership courses as you want to. Um, you can go to all the best schools you want to, but if you're not comfortable inside you, if you don't feel, you know, um, at one and at peace and, and comfortable in your skin, it really doesn't matter. And then what happens is you allow everybody else then to ident- you know, to build your identity because it's coming from outside rather than inside, you know? Wow, that's so deep. And it, it's, it's, it's just fascinating thinking about, uh, you know, that there is that you could, you could keep piling on and trying to, you know, get all of the awards and accomplishments and write all of the research papers, but that won't necessarily fill you know, whatever that need is or want that you have in your life is. And so I think it's an interesting insight because, you know, one thing I'm tr- I am always try to convey to people is like that where you are now, the person who I say, oh, I'm, I definitely want to, to reach out to her and talk with, talk with Hina about her work and her experience and her life, you know, that might, it, it, it might, it probably wouldn't have been the same when you were, you know, like let's say 20 years ago, still figuring things out or whatever the case might be. And so I, I think that's, that's fascinating. And, and there's a lot that we could dive into as we, we go along. I really loved like, our conversation and just all of the insight you have to share. And I think one, one question that I'll, that I'll ask as we start to wrap up, even though it feels like we just got started, is um, just about your, your life and your story overall. Um, and I ask this to everyone I, I interview, but I wonder like if your life, I think I know I'll have follow-up questions to this, but if your life were a book or a documentary, what would the title of it be and why? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so they, uh, that's like, that's, by the way, that's the re- reaction that I get pretty much every time. <laughs> um, maybe embrace change. Hmm. Um, a global nomad's journey uh, to finding her purpose. I feel um, in, in my case, it really has been that. It's, it's taken a journey across many, many countries and settings to find what my true purpose is. Uh, and, and the embracing change part is very, very important. Um, I, I absolutely actively fight and resist change. I hate anything changing. And, um, and every time things have changed, it's been for the better. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, taken me a long time to just sort of have faith in the universe's plan for myself, you know, and let things go and just let things be. Um, I really <clears throat> feel uh, 
you know, in addition to sort of thinking about my journey, the, the, the area that, um, you know, that I was also telling you about was the positive platforms, um, that it would be great to get your insight now that I have you uh, on this yeah. platform. Um, so about a month ago, uh, early November, I decided to take off Instagram and Facebook off my phone. Uh, and partly the reason I did it is because my, my daughter was starting her exams and I took it off her phone and felt a bit hypocritical to do it on her phone and, and, and still be online. And plus, and I really thought I'd miss it because I, I spent a lot of time sort of endlessly browsing through stories and things. And I didn't miss it at all. And what I found is that I, I got more involved in LinkedIn. Um, I used to think of LinkedIn as a platform which was just, you know, if you're looking for a job, you go in there and you connect with people, but it's become so much more. Right. And I love the articles that I read and the people that I'm connecting with and, and just things people share has been incredible. And often I find stories about young people and I call my daughter and I'm like, hey, look at this. And then I thought, you know, it's a pity you don't have a platform like this that you can go to. And I've been thinking about this for a while. So I did a survey and I said, I want to send this to you and other young people where I asked, mm -hmm. you know, what are the plat media platforms you're on? How long do you spend on media? And we know all of this. So it's a lot of time that young people spend on it. But then I said, would you be interested in a more positive platform for young people to engage in? Kind of a LinkedIn, but for adolescents and young people. Mm -hmm. And on that platform, I want to be a, people to be able to share stories of achievements um, of young people. So you could have created something, you could have done something incredible with your community, you could have done something incredible in a science project, you can share it on that platform. People can engage with you about it. Um, as well as a place where there's resources for finding out about summer programs, grants, scholarships, you know, academic or sports, whatever, but a one place where any young person wants information during school age years, as well as those transitioning, uh, you know, in and out of university, job skills, a place where they can help you build your resume. It's all on one platform. And it was incredible. So far, the feedback has been that uh, people are very interested. Um, and when, it, when I ask them what you don't like about social media, it's, it's a lot of uh, horrific stuff that's coming out that they're experiencing through it, but yet they just don't want to let go. And I think partly we don't have uh, positive alternatives for young people to spend time. I mean, whether we like it or not, people are going to be on their phones. Why don't we find other ways for them to feel inspired? You know, I feel just being on LinkedIn more this past month um, has given me so many ideas on things I can do. And I've been so inspired by what other women are doing. Yeah. It's a pity that young people don't have the same platform. So that's my 2020 goal is yeah. to create this platform. I even asked what name they like. I liked Motivate Me, M Squared, because it had a mathematical thing and I love math. But the name they all like is Connected. Because uh, I, I listed a few sort of names. So my, my thing is now I'm going to India on holidays. I'm going to try and see if I can get a team together of a software engineer. And, and anyways, in that space is how I came across Second News because it looks like they do similar um, sort of work and came across Jordi. Yeah, and it's, it's so interesting because just to tie all of it together um, and thinking about your, your book or documentary and the title, title of Embracing Change, like, and then thinking about what you were just sharing, um, I, it, I, my mom's a college professor at, well, she's, she's actually just retiring this semester, but she's a college professor uh, currently still at Kane University in, in um, New Jersey. And she's been a professor for about 30, 30 years or so, I want to say. Wow. I think the thing that's fascinating is we were talking over Thanksgiving about uh, just students and the academic environment and how it better best supports students and then uh you know you referenced the work with second use the program uh headstream innovation is the yes and that's actually what i'd seen was the headstream but i think they were looking i saw this grant challenge and they're looking for people i think who've had their company for a few years yeah. but it, at least the questions they asked gave me good ideas on what i should be thinking about as i start developing this but I think the beautiful thing is that you're really thinking about it. Like it is necessary to shift those spaces and create things that work for people, except, you know, like Facebook wants those, uh, the teens to still be using Facebook and wants all of us to still be using Facebook. And the same goes for Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and like TikTok, which I don't even really know what TikTok is right My now. daughter, yeah, loves it. <laughs> Apparently her generation, the adolescents, no one is on Facebook. Yeah. Uh, and the young people, very few people were the ones I surveyed. It's mainly Instagram, yeah. YouTube, 
Yeah. They love YouTube um, and TikTok uh, uh, was some of the, and there's something called Tumblr, which I don't even know yeah. what that is, yeah. uh, are the ones that the young people now use more and Snapchat. Yeah. So it's, but it's interesting because I, I, I it's, and maybe this is not something, this probably isn't something that even like a, occurs to you, but at least the thing that I'm seeing in you is just like this curiosity to understand further and then of course do something about it. Whereas we have a lot of systems and it's a lot easier to keep things the way that they are. But mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it, it, it's just kind of funny because in this conversation I've got, I've picked up on just your will to change things or push back or, or, you know, when you didn't know what, uh, what other people were doing when you're first starting your career and diving into your, your academic life, uh, academic uh, life in that sense, like you, you carved your own path. And I think that's a really good lesson for, for people that like, it's good to do, it's good to push, it's good to mm -hmm. question things even, and to, to carve out a path that, um, you know, that works. And, and I'm, I'm excited for what's going to come out of your 2020 and what you'll create mm -hmm. and to talk more about, you know, about that, program and that idea. And also, I just want to say, it's, it's interesting, because you also referenced, like your own social media use and LinkedIn, which is how we're connected, because yeah. one day I just looked at my, I looked at my connections thinking about who I want to interview. And then I saw you pop up there. Oh, gosh, this is awesome. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I there's yeah, all so interesting. Hey, yeah. It really has been an interesting journey on LinkedIn and, and the interesting people I've met through it and you included and just so fascinated with the kinds of very diverse things people are doing um, in, in various fields. I, I just love it. It's incredible. Yeah. And it's I think that's it, what I want young people to grow up to have as well is to have that kind of opportunity. And if you want to come to South Africa to say, okay, what are the opportunities for me to spend a summer here? And, you know, uh, connect you to host families and these are the academic programs you can be part of but really try and make it into a global community mm -hmm. where young people can engage with each other inspire each other um i i actually created a group whatsapp list for my daughter and my nephews who all have phones and um every day i send them a story of something a young person in the world has accomplished mm -hmm. um and the reason i started doing that a couple of years ago is because i got tired of them saying well i'm just a kid there's nothing i can do and i'm like well guess what yeah. You know, this 11-year-old in Nigeria just found a mathematical formula to look at the division by seven. <laughs> like, they're catching incredible things. Yeah. And maybe you see this. Not every one of us has to be a genius in something. You will realize it really is just being curious and applying your mind to something. And so I thought, okay, I've been doing this anyways. Let me try and see if I can make this into a website and a platform where everyone can sort of engage in the same way. Wow. And I, I kind of just wonder at a big, bigger picture level, like if, so you mentioned like your nephews and you mentioned your own kids and your own children. And I wonder like if there was one piece of advice you have to give, cause you've already shared a lot of insight and experiences and advice, but if there's one piece of advice that at least at this point, because I'm sure it will evolve over time um, that you had to give them, what would that piece of advice be? I think don't stop being curious and don't allow a fear of failure mm -hmm. to let you um, uh, experience things that are unknown um, is, is, is what I'd sort of leave it at. Uh, I feel as we get older, we stop becoming curious. We stop asking questions because we're so cautious. We're so worried about what people will think about us. And which is why it's so nice when you, when you see really young children not care about that and they ask things yeah from a perspective of innocence and, and curiosity. And I think, how do you keep that stimulated in a life where you, you really don't stop asking questions and understanding things and following your dreams? Yeah, and speaking of following, I'm wondering where can people follow along with your journey or connect with you on, online? What, what's the best way for them to connect with you and your, your work? Um, I think, you know, like I said, I, I let go of Facebook and Instagram because it just became too time consuming. Um, so I'm now mainly on LinkedIn um, and WhatsApp. I think when people want to share messages or whatever, they do it, but mainly just LinkedIn. Um, I just find that with my work being what it is, um, 
and also wanting to carve out non sort of media time for the family, which I've really tried to make into a conscious habit when come home, put the phone away, put everything away. And I love reading. And so just my love of books, um, you know, I'll read about 50 to 70 books a year. A year. Um, so it, it kind of has now really made the time very, very small. Um, and so I'd rather use it to do, to read about things that are inspiring to me, which a lot of the stuff and the people I've started following recently on LinkedIn has been for me. Um, and the rest of it, I'm just happy to let go. Wow. So thank you. I just want to say thank you. I, I'm excited already for our next time to connect whenever that that will be hopefully sooner sure. than later but this and is it was so nice to meet you and i'm so impressed with somebody your age being such an eloquent um in-depth interviewer <laughs> i think you know what like you could, i, I spent a lot of trying training people in qualitative interviews and you you do you're doing a great job with the follow-up questions and being a very good listener so kudos to you for that thank you and there's a there's a lot that you make it really easy by um by sharing your story, I think, and this is something that I was saying before we started, but not everyone is like so willing to share their story. Not everyone is so willing to like be authentic. I think a lot of people just want to look, um, you know, a lot of people want to, and this goes back to social media actually, but a lot of people want to look strong or be perceived as powerful and, um, a lot of these different characteristics and I think it, it's good when people could just be open and honest and share their journey because that's what brings people close to somebody because they're more human and connectable yeah exactly and they're more human and connectable and so I just want to thank you for all of that but as we wrap up this <laughs> this interview um, I just kind of uh, I, I want to uh, I always say the same thing to wrap up every interview and um, <laughs> It's and just to give context on it before I say it, it's really because, as you pointed out, like it's not easy to um, make an impact in the world. Sometimes you're working with a difficult subject or different topic, different field, um, like or difficult, I should say, difficult field. Uh, sometimes it might be because of your identity, like you mentioned, as a woman of color, um, and and as someone who's lived in these different cultures, and so. Uh, the phrase that I say at the end of these interviews is to keep impacting. And I really hope that you could keep making that impact um, despite all of the different barriers that, that, you know, have popped up along the way, which you've already been smashing through. And so I just want to thank you for sharing your, your story and for all of that. Thanks, Matt. And likewise, I, 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 I look forward to seeing your journey in 180 degrees and many other things I'm sure you're going to go into accomplish. So I'll be watching that space too. Oh, wow. okay. Thank you. <laughs> and have my kids follow you as well so that they have another role model um, in a young men of color who they can see doing um, incredible things and being an entrepreneur. Yeah, and if, if they want to learn more about uh, 180 Degrees of Impact and, and what I'm building out here, which is expanding or changing and evolving even more by the day in exciting ways, they could visit www.lets.care. It's really simple. Let's? Let's no, what is it again? Let's.care. Yeah. Okay. And so All they right. can check that out. But thanks again, and I'll say it again to punctuate it, but keep impacting. Doctor. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. You too.